funny that in the age of advanced communication technology, we seem to have just as much trouble really connecting as we ever did. Excuse me for a sec. Hello, Nick speaking. Sorry, sorry I missed that. Yeah, you know, you're dropping out. Oh, right, yeah, I got that bit. Hello, I'm, I'm losing you. Hello? It's so frustrating. Dropped out again. Don't you just hate that? I mean, it's bad enough when technology lets us down, but it's worse when our real life connections fail as well. If communication breaks down, you're not going to be on the same page anymore, are you? You're, it's like uh, the lack of communication means you, you can be going in a different direction to the other person, regardless of what um, context that relationship's in. I believe that most of the times it is because I don't communicate well enough, because my fiance she doesn't have a problem with expressing herself, while I tend to more keep it in my head and think about it. So, what does it take to make a good connection? I spoke to a number of relationship experts, including Dr. Scott Stanley, director of the Center for Marital and Family Studies and research professor of psychology at the University of Denver, Colorado. I asked him, how do you communicate effectively in a relationship? I believe the hallmark of successful communication in relationships is a feeling of safety between the two people, especially where we're talking about either romantic partners or colleagues or family members, so where there's an ongoing relationship that matters. You're going to see really good communication if both people feel safe in the conversation and feel like they can each say what they need to say, feel like they're going to be heard, feel like they're going to be respected. So does that mean that respect and feeling safe are really important for good communication? Does it mean that if we're in an emotionally safe relationship, we'll be able to talk more openly about how we're feeling? If two people feel really emotionally safe and there's something important being talked about, there will be emotion and it'll be expressed and it'll be heard and it'll, it'll function to bring the two people together. Yes, but not all of us find it easy to share our feelings with our partner. What makes it so difficult? If you've come from a family where feelings were never talked about and, and you know, you just haven't had a lot of practice at that, this is not going to come easily. But um, your partner may need to understand what's happening for you. Now, for you to be able to just share that with your partner, you've got to actually get in touch with it yourself. You've got to have some self-awareness and to be able to be honest with yourself about what's happening in your world, inside your own head, in, in the world that you inhabit. Uh, and, and that's where I think it is difficult. If we, if we don't have um, a developing self-awareness, then we're not going to be able to share ourselves with the other person. Equally, if we're, if we're not very honest with ourselves about what's happening, if we're um, habitually denying to ourselves what's going on for us. You know, let's say we're angry, but we're denying that we're angry because we've come from a family where it's not okay. To, to show anger or to admit that you have strong feelings like that. If you're not being honest with yourself, you're not going to be able to be open with your partner and in a, in a constructive way share, well, you know, when this and this happened, I was feeling really angry. You're simply not going to be able to do that. So everyone starts from a different place with this thing called sharing of feelings. Uh, but I do believe it is, um, some of it, and an, and an increasing amount of it is important to um, the sustainability of a relationship. In terms of how we communicate in our conflict, we come from very different families. My parents, I never heard them argue the whole time I was living with them. And whereas Heather's uh, family had a full, expressed a full range of emotions. Mm. Mm. So I couldn't quite believe when we were first uh, married, when you'd said that you'd never had heard an argument of your parents, I thought, oh, you just, you just must have tuned out as a teenager and a young adult, you know. Uh, and then I checked out with your other three siblings and I just couldn't believe that there was just no arguments mm. whatsoever. And, uh, but that's the way it was mm. uh, for your family. So to, to marry me where having an argument was okay as long as you repaired it, you worked on the, the uh, you know, what brought on the argument and, and worked through it, 
um, I always felt safe in my parents' marriage, mm -hmm. uh, knowing that, you know, they could raise their voice and it was okay as long as it was worked through. It seems that being able to openly share with each other how we think and feel about issues is essential for effective communication and for developing a sense of intimacy in our relationship. Dr. Richard Swartz is the director at the Center for Self-Leadership in Chicago. I asked him whether he believed there were any risks involved in honestly sharing our feelings with our partner. Intimacy requires uh, a lot of emotional safety. And by that I mean it requires the, the trust that I can expose myself and expose these most vulnerable parts of me to my partner and that partner won't abuse the privilege. I think the, the most difficult task that couples face if they're really wanting to achieve intimacy is feeling safe to expose all parts of themselves to the other person and then trusting that that, that risk won't be uh, violated. It's remarkable how easily a person can slip into fearing that that trust is not there or, or that they can't have confidence in the other person. So for example, a person in a couple might um, start to really doubt whether their partner is even committed to them at all by virtue of how they're interpreting their behaviour. Let's say they're spending more time at work. They're not coming home as early or they're, they're, they seem to be emotionally less available to you. You can start to think to yourself, well, this means he or she is not in love with me anymore. They're actually going to leave me. It's very easy to slip into that fear of loss, yeah. of loss of love, of loss of commitment, of loss of the relationship. The relationship between good communication and safety, I think, is, is reciprocal, so it goes both directions. People that communicate safely are going to build, an emotional safety is really what I'm keen on here, are going to build a sense of emotional connection and security in the relationship. But it's also true when, for whatever other reasons of what's going on in the relationship, if people feel generally more emotionally safe and connected, they're pretty much likely to communicate better as well. So one influences the other. Uh, which is important to know from, from kind of a how things work perspective. When we talk about trying to actually help a couple do a better job of communicating, um, you don't just say, okay, talk safely now. You're going to pick some strategies that hopefully move them in that direction, but the goal is the safety part more than the strategies themselves. It is difficult to share our feelings sometimes, particularly if we're... Um, both tired or a bit stressed, um, it, it can be quite difficult. Um, you like to think that the other person will just understand, just look at you and see your face and know that you, you're stressed and tired and what you need, but it doesn't always work that way, so sometimes it's difficult. Um, but if we're going really well, then we find it easy to share, we're comfortable um, to share. So it's more about how we're feeling mm. at the time that affects how difficult it is. Yeah, I agree. I, it, it, it really depends on how the individual is. Like, if, if yeah, I always find it easy to share with 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 Kelly, but it's more uh, if I'm feeling a bit stressed, I, I tend to internalise things, and that's when I find it hard to share. But it's nothing the other person's doing. It's more, yeah, as Kelly said, the individual. Right. Yeah, good. Thanks. Good. Okay. World-renowned marriage and family researcher Dr. David Olson, director of Life Innovations in Minneapolis, Minnesota has spent over 30 years researching couple and family relationships. I asked Dr. Olson about his research and if he has found any connection between emotional safety, building closeness and trust, and sharing feelings. We find there's a very strong connection between emotional closeness and communication. If a couple and a family share their feelings, both their positive feelings and their negative feelings with each other, and the other person can really just understand, not react, but simply show they understand. And we talk about active listening. That is, letting the other person know that you heard at the feeling level what they're going through. A lot of times when we send messages, we're sending a message about emotion and content. Most often when people give 
feedback, they give feedback at the content level and not at the emotion level. And so what we say is when you're listening to someone and you want to really show you understand, and that's what a good therapist does, they, get, they go first to the feeling and they say, oh, I hear, I hear you're feeling frustrated or you're feeling sad. And the person says, you understand. You don't even have to go into the content, okay? So responding at the feeling level builds emotional connection. That may not be as easy as it sounds. Why don't you actually say oh. what you mean, Richard? Oh, oh, what I mean, I mean... No, I'm trying you, to tell I, you something you here, okay? No, the you trouble not... with you is that you don't listen to me. I don't right? listen. You don't shut up. Learning to really listen to each other can be a challenge for many of us. But Dr. Scott Stanley has been teaching the speaker-listener technique to couples for many years to help them learn just this, to really listen so they get to understand and connect with each other. We have taught couples what we call the speaker-listener technique, where we'll give them a, an object, usually it's a card that has the rules for the technique on it, but it could be any object, where that object is meant to represent who has the floor in the conversation. So for example, in the speaker-listener technique, when I'm the speaker, my primary goal is to get my message across and to get it across in a way that the listener can really hear it. So I want to be clear, I want to be focused, I want to be not attacking or uh, doing things that would set the listener off, but just sort of calmly and clearly making my point and expressing it, and that's going to be my key job as the speaker. If you don't have the floor in our technique, by definition, you're at the moment the listener. When we're teaching the, the speaker-listener technique, what we're trying to teach the listener is really even more important than the speaker because the listener's job is to focus on the speaker's message. And what we're doing within the technique is encouraging them to use a variety of active listening strategies that are designed to really show the speaker, one, that they're paying attention to the speaker's message, and two, to, to help the speaker understand, here's what I'm hearing, you know, here's the message. And that way, if the message isn't quite right or not accurate, then the speaker can clarify as they continue to, to communicate. But the essential role of the listener is to tune into the speaker's message. And the reason why that's difficult is especially when there's an issue or there's a conflict or there's a concern between two people that love each other, the natural tendency is to want to make our point and get our point across. And this most difficult part of the whole uh, communication cycle between the two partners is for each to take a turn, good turns, really listening to what the other has to say. Sometimes I feel as though it's best you go alone. Being a good listener seems a pretty tough assignment when most of us simply want to make sure we get our own message across. So what can we do to learn to be a better listener? In order to teach somebody to be a good listener, in our approach, what we try to do is focus on a couple of essential things. Uh, we don't want to focus on too many things because people cannot keep all that many things in mind. So in that context, we want the listener to do two things in particular. One is to edit out their tendency to say their own thing, to comment on their point of view, or to disagree with the speaker, or anything like that. The second thing we want the listener to do is, is much more purely technical, and it's just in the service of facilitating clarity, is we want the listener to paraphrase what they hear the speaker saying. Sometimes people make a mistake and they assume paraphrasing means parroting, and, and we don't mean just sort of mechanically or without apparent interest sort of telling the other what we heard them say. What we really mean is for that listener to show a genuine concern of getting the speaker's message right by saying things like this. Um, so what I hear you saying, so, so what you're saying is it frustrates you when I take my clothes off at night and just leave them on the bedroom floor. Uh, we want the, the listener to try to put themselves in the speaker's position and tell the speaker in their own words what they hear them saying so then the speaker knows that the listener is A, really listening, and B, whether they got their message across. It's easy to say, oh, I hear what you're saying, but in reality, you know, often I'm not actually hearing what she is saying. It's, it's easy to say those words, but to actually listen to what she's saying or to actually listen through the, um, the raised voice or, you know, the, the external 
effects of, of a fight, it's hard to cut through to, to the bottom line. And I do know that, that Kelly's a lot better at that than I am. I tend to take things quite emotionally and listen to more the, uh, the raised voice or you know, the stress of it all rather than, than listening to the actual problem. And that's something that, um, that we, especially me, have, has been working on. I think my trouble is I'm so busy trying to get across my point of view so that he understands me that I don't always hear what he has to say. Um, so that I feel like I'm listening and taking on board what he's saying, but I'm just getting ready to say my point of view. So that's um, something we're, we're getting a lot better at. At the end of the day, it, it is still a fight and we're, you know, you're always fighting to get your point of view across and, uh, you know, we, we, we're only human and we think the easiest way is to talk louder or talk stronger, but at the end of the day it's not. It's, it's you know, it's getting, cutting back to what the actual message is and, and when you're emotional it's hard to do that and, and that's just, just human nature. We don't really shout at each other or anything. No. Though. We're quite civilised about it, but <laughs> we, yeah, we get our, get our point across. really ticks me off when I can't get to where I've got to go because the road's blocked. It's a bit like that in relationships. Some experts talk about the roadblocks on the way, the connection. Patterns of responses that usually lead to frustration, anger and disconnection. I spoke with Paul Borges about the things we do that block good communication. The blocks to communication have been well documented by a number of authors in the field. They basically fall into three categories. Judging, sending solutions and avoiding the other's concerns. The most popular list of those has been called the Dirty Dozen, where there's 12 of them that have been identified. Let me just highlight perhaps a few of those. In the category of judging, there's things like criticising, name calling or diagnosing the other person. And, and if there's one thing that really shuts people down is when phrases are used such as, you know what the problem with you is? You know, the problem with you is you're just like your dad or stuff like that. I mean, that'll shut down a communication process instantly. The sending solutions is also something that I think a lot of people do in relationships, thinking that they're actually being helpful. Now, there's a, a number of of these such as ordering and threatening, and, and they're more obviously unhelpful. However, there's other things such as inappropriate questioning. When a person is asking a lot of questions in order to show interest in the other person, but the listener uh, is actually receiving that as almost in interrogation. So that's not particularly helpful. Moralizing is, is another one that doesn't work well. You know what you should do is, Sometimes we just need to talk about our stuff and we just need the other person to grunt, to nod, to say, wow, that must be really tough. I'm sorry you've had such a lousy day. We don't actually want them to fix anything. Now, one of the things that we notice as couple counsellors in relationships is men often want to fix things and women don't want to be fixed. They want to be listened to, they want to be held, they want to be understood, they don't want to be fixed. You know what you should do, honey, is, well, honey just wants to be listened to, she just wants to be understood. Avoiding the other's concerns is when we're, it's like we're too busy to really give the other person our, our care. It, it's, it's like we, we're too busy to really step into their world, the term that we as counsellors use is the term empathy. And so we may divert the conversation. So we may tell our own story, for example, oh, that's just like me earlier this morning. And so again, that person just shuts down, says, well, I actually wanted to talk to you. I didn't actually want to hear your story right now. Or logical argument, yeah, but it couldn't have been this way because of this, this, this. Again, shuts it down. Even over reassuring, which is often done with the best of intentions, oh, I'm sure you'll be okay, you'll be just fine, you always manage to get through this. But the person may not feel as if they can get through it. So having their partner say, I'm sure you'll be just fine, is often taken as a statement of, well, you don't really get me. You don't really understand how scared I am or how angry I am or how upset I am about what has happened. I think for me the most important thing with communication in our marriage is, is to do it regularly and to do it um, as often as possible and uh, to not let it build up because 
you know, most of our disagreements come from a lack of communication and, and just builds up and builds up into something out of proportion. So you can, you can always map and see when we are closest, when we are re regularly communicating with each other, that uh, our marriage is, is as close as it, it has been. Mm, just staying connected. Um, and learning too, we, we made a, a commitment at the very beginning of our relationship that we wouldn't go to bed angry with each other, um, which we, we do most we of the time. We have some late nights though. But we've also learnt too that sometimes it's really good to walk away yeah. and come back to it. Um, so it's just working out, working, yeah, working out what's the most effective strategy. I think it's time. it's unfortunate that we are both stubborn personalities <laughs> and we don't like to let things um, fester. And we, you know, we like to see a winner, even though that just doesn't happen in marriage. You don't win anymore. Um, <laughs> So I think, it's, yeah, it's, you, yeah, Kelly's right. What, trying to find out what battles are worth, worth fighting and what, we, what is worth just letting go. We found we actually don't... Um, if we're communicating well, we don't actually argue about anything important. Um, we find our struggles with communication are about silly little things that we've just um, misunderstood mm. or we're just both tired and need to go to bed. Communication is not just about talking at someone. It's about listening. And, and listening not just to their words, but to what's behind the words. And, and, and that is about standing in their shoes, trying to see the world through their eyes. And relationships that are working well, um, what you see in them is that the two people have worked out a way of communicating with each other that works. You know, it's not, not, it's not may not be perfect in, in our eyes, but it works for them. It meets the needs of those two people. They're, they can understand each other in a way that allows that emotional intimacy to grow, that allows them to get things done, that allows them to feel safe and to be able to go on and, uh, and, and continue in safety in the relationship, which is what I call a sustainable partnership. Ah, relationships. Good communication is really important. Having a conversation that has a clear connection where the dialogue is intimate and we're really listening to each other. Are you with me?